The call came at just after one in the morning. It was Mabel Normand, and she needed to see him right away. William Desmond Taylor didn't hesitate. Dressing quickly, he headed out of his apartment and drove down 7th Street. It was the summer of 1920 and so warm that he rolled down the windows to let in the scent of night-blooming jasmine. It was one of his favorite things about this city. He got out and crossed the street to the Pacific Dining Car Restaurant. He knew why Mabel picked it. The converted railway car was open all night and she had a regular booth in the back. She was sitting alone with an uneaten chicken sandwich in front of her. She smiled when she saw him, but her eyes were glossy and wet. Their brilliance dulled. She was there and not there at the same time. Mabel, how's my girl? His voice was tinged with exasperation and sadness. He slid into the booth opposite her, waving down the waitress for two strong cups of coffee. They had only met a little more than a year ago, but it felt like they had known each other forever. A few months into their friendship, she told him her secret. She was addicted to drugs, mostly cocaine and whatever else might come her way. She told him because she needed his help. Taylor desperately wanted to help this beautiful friend, but he wasn't sure how. Nights like this one were becoming all too common. He hated what the drugs were doing to Mabel. He saw so many people fall into its clutches. Getting out was a whole other ballgame. He took one of her hands in his and looked in her eyes. Oh, Mabel, you must stop. I'm just having a bad week, but she didn't sound at all convinced. It's a little bump in the road. On the road to hell, he thought, but didn't say it. Although he could have and she would have just laughed but it wasn't a laughing moment. Mabel suddenly became agitated and stood up. She said she had to go to the bathroom. He touched her arm. Leave your purse here, he pleaded. She yanked it away. Stop being a bore, Billy. When she came out, he offered his arm and she took it. Let's go for a drive, he said. Her face looked calm, but her eyes were dull again from whatever she had taken in the bathroom. Taylor helped her into the passenger seat. She asked if they were going to a party. Sure, blessed baby, he said, using his pet name for her. But he was lying. As he started up the McFarlane, he told himself he was doing it for her own good. There was a small hospital the studio used to help hopped up actors, quietly so there wouldn't be any press. He knew it was a temporary fix. Mabel needed long-term treatment, and he was determined to help her find it. Please let her be okay, he whispered aloud. Mabel couldn't hear him. She had nodded off. Taylor pursed his lips in a tight smile, something he only did when he was angry. Right now, he was very angry at the people who were peddling drugs to Mabel. He was going to find a way to deal with them. But first he had to get her help. We get support from Believe Her, a new true crime podcast from Lemonada and Spiegel and Grau. In September 2017, young mom Nikki Automondo shot and killed her partner, Chris Grover. She was sentenced to 19 years to life in prison for murder. Through rare access to police audio, a month-long trial, conversations with Nikki, and original reporting, journalist Justine Vanderloon lays out the killing, the evidence, and the aftermath. As this six-part series unfolds, listeners will put together different pieces of a disturbing puzzle. One thing is clear. Perception is not reality. Believe Her is a riveting chronicle that grapples with assumptions we make about domestic and sexual violence, the long reach of trauma, and the ways in which survival is criminalized, leaving us shocked at how far people will go to avoid seeing what's right in front of them. Believe Her premieres October 21st. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Wondery's shocking true crime podcast, Over My Dead Body, is back for a third season with a story about corruption, betrayal, and the secrets of a fallen hero. Follow Over My Dead Body, season three, Fox Lake, on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening right now. From Wondery, I'm Tracy Patton, along with my co-host, James Remar. This is Hollywood and Crime, Murder in Hollywood Land. On our last episode, a star-studded funeral was held for the murder director, but love-struck Mary Miles Minter was not in attendance. Taylor's ex-valet, Edward Sands, remains the prime suspect in the murder, but Detective Ed King suspects the key to solving the case hinges on Minter and her overbearing mother, Charlotte Shelby. This is episode four, Charlotte's Web. Detective Ed King arrives at the famous player's Lasky studio just after 8 a.m. on February 17th. It's been 10 days since an all-points bulletin was put out on Edward Sands. Sands is still the main suspect in the murder of William Desmond Taylor, but no one has seen him, at least anyone who's willing to talk. King still isn't convinced of his guilt. Sands has the profile of a two-bit criminal, not a murderer. His pet theory is that actress Mary Miles Minter and her mother Charlotte have something to do with this, or are hiding something, but his boss shut him down. He's not sure why DA Thomas Woolwine has been protecting them. Sure, the motive is hazy. He'll give Woolwine that. But King's got one of those gut feelings. Minter was clearly obsessed with Taylor, and her mother clearly didn't like it and neither of them have been exactly forthcoming so far. Hell, no one's even questioned the mother yet. There are other leads King wants to chase down as well, like reports of drugs on the studio lot, drugs that Taylor wanted gone, and dealers who wouldn't have been too happy to comply. But first, he's going to follow that gut feeling he has. He wants to talk with a screenwriter at Famous Players Lasky, who knew Taylor well. He parks his Indian scout on the street and walks through the lot. 
Even though King's been on the LAPD for nearly 20 years, movie make-believe still leaves him a little bit wowed. A group of burly set dressers carrying a giant bathtub pass him by, followed by three Roman centurions wearing golden helmets. Two bathing beauties in white silk robes scurry past and wave at the men, their heels clopping on the pavement. Taylor's office is next to the screenwriters, and King decides to take a quick look. It's been ten days since the director's funeral, but the placard on the door still bears his name. William D. Taylor, director. Inside, it looks like Taylor might have just stepped out for a coffee break. Scripts piled up in the corners, an ashtray filled with cigarette butts on the shelf. Police have already searched the place and found nothing of substance. Not that they expected to. The studio cleaned out Taylor's apartment. They would have done the same to his office. King quickly exits and raps on the door next to Taylor's. When he enters, he sees Julia Crawford Ivers sitting at her desk typing at an impressive speed. He watches as her fingers fly across the keys. Finally, she stops and stands up, offering a hand stained with ink. She is a tall, big-boned woman with deep-set eyes and a no-nonsense look that reminds King of his grade school teachers. But the woman is a triple threat in Hollywood. She writes, directs, and edits. But only because the men at the top let her. Since her films bring in money, and money's the bottom line in this town, she gets to play with the big boys. At least for now. King is anxious to get her take. Taylor and Ivers collaborated on several pictures over the last seven years. You work together that long, you form a close bond. And you talk. Let me guess, she says. You want to know about Taylor's women. She's smart. No sense beating around the bush. What can you tell me about Mary Miles Minter? Ivers' face sours before she speaks. What can I say? She was a pest. From the minute she met him on the Green Gable set, she harassed Bill incessantly. I felt duty-bound to buffer him, as much as I could anyway. She may have been a child, but that didn't make her obsession any less troublesome. King asks how Mary's mother, Charlotte Shelby, responded to Mary's crush on Taylor. Ivers hesitates, but only for a moment. Mrs. Shelby seemed to hold Bill responsible for Mary's behavior. While Bill did everything he could to push Mary away, Mrs. Shelby still thought he was to blame. To show her displeasure, she often sought Bill out on the set to yell at him about one thing or another. How did he react to that? Ivers shakes her head. Bill was always the gentleman and the consummate professional. Besides, famous players paired Bill and Mary together for four pictures. Short of quitting the job that he loved, there was nothing he could do. Though he did manage to get himself moved to another part of the studio so he didn't have to see her every day. Let me guess. It didn't work. Ivers nods her head. When Mary couldn't find him on the lot, she made house calls. And the more Mary dug into Taylor, the angrier her mother got. At Bill. One time on the set, she even told him she would blow his brains out. King blinks. Mrs. Shelby actually threatened him? Ivers responds with a sarcastic laugh. Detective, are you familiar with the Dendroespis polylapis? Can't say that I am. It's the black mamba snake, known for using its lethal fangs to repeatedly stab anyone unlucky enough to get in its way. Its toxic venom renders the victim dead within 30 minutes. Ivers pauses for dramatic effect. Charlotte Shelby is like the mamba snake. If she feels threatened, she'll strike quickly and hard, particularly where her famous daughter is concerned. King isn't sure how to respond. He can't get the image of the deadly snake out of his head. But Ivers isn't finished. You know, you really should talk to Miss Whitney, Charlotte's former secretary. She definitely has opinions about her former boss. She works at a bank nearby. King quickly makes a decision. His meeting with the U.S. attorney about the drug problem isn't until one. He has just enough time to squeeze it in. He stands up and reaches out his hand. Ivers grasps it firmly. Find out who did this, huh? Bill was one of the good ones, and there aren't many of those anymore. Mary Miles Minter and Charlotte Shelby glared at each other from across the room. It was a battle of wills between mother and daughter, and neither had any intention of giving in. Charlotte was through with the teenager's willful stubbornness. I will ask you one last time, she said. Have you been out with Taylor? Mary spat back. I am a grown woman, and this is not your concern. But Charlotte Shelby wasn't backing down. You've been sleeping with him. I know it. That's when her daughter erupted and started to scream. And that wasn't acceptable behavior for Charlotte. She grabbed the pitcher of water on the side table and poured it over Mary's head. Mary ran up the stairs. I'm going to end it all, she cried. Mrs. Shelby could hear the slam of her bedroom door. Charlotte took the stairs two at a time, the staff nervously following behind. Before they reached Mary's door, a shot rang out. Everyone froze. It was followed by another. One of the staff members screamed. But Charlotte was calm. Break down the door, she said to the butler. He obeyed, knocking the door off its hinges. Inside, Mary was on the floor, completely still, Charlotte's gun next to her body. Charlotte put a fist up to her mouth in alarm. The butler was the first to move forward. He scooped up the girl as everyone looked on, horrified. That's when Mary opened her eyes and triumphantly announced, I thought I would give you all the jolt. Charlotte was livid. She had endured a lot over the years to bring Mary to the pinnacle of a career most girls only dreamed of. Her daughter was so ungrateful and naive. And all these histrionics over a man, an old man for that matter. William Desmond Taylor must be at least 45, though you never could tell in Hollywood. This is his fault, Charlotte thought to herself. All of it. She had made it clear to Taylor that she would blow his brains out if he went near her daughter again. Mary may not know what was good for her, but Charlotte did. And it was a promise she intended to keep. Detective. 
Detective King pulls into the bank parking lot on Larchmont Boulevard. He's paying a surprise visit to Charlotte Whitney, former secretary to Mrs. Charlotte Shelby. He wants to find out more about the controlling stage mother. King walks through the bank lobby until he sees a nameplate on the desk. Miss Whitney. He introduces himself. Miss Whitney, I'm Detective King, LAPD. Whitney eagerly greets him as if he were an old high school chum, which gives him pause. There are two kinds of witnesses in a murder case. The ones who don't want to talk, and the ones who want to talk too much. Clearly Miss Whitney is the latter. She quickly confirms Julia Ivers' story. Charlotte confronted Taylor on the studio lot all right, and threatened to shoot him if he didn't stay away from Mary. And she's keen to share another juicy tidbit about Mrs. Shelby. Turns out Mary had been flirting with a 34-year-old actor named Monty Blue. When Shelby found him hanging around the set, she literally chased him away in front of the entire crew. King asks Whitney if Charlotte Shelby owns a gun. The secretary confirms that she does. A 38 revolver. The butler told her the caliber was 38. She doesn't know much about guns, but she trusts the butler. He's a young man, smarter than most kids his age who are fixated on matinees and girls. But the kid's into fishing and hunting, even in a big city like this. Go figure. King holds up his hand to interrupt her chatter. In your opinion, is Charlotte Shelby dangerous? Whitney doesn't miss a beat. I wouldn't put anything past her. I feel sorry for her daughters. Both of them. King is curious about the sister. Her name is Margaret. She was a kid actor too, until Mrs. Shelby realized Mary was the more bankable daughter. And Margaret is one of Mary's alibis for the night of the murder. Are you referring to Margaret, he asks. The former secretary again proves to be a fountain of information. Poor Margaret. She's the older sister who can't figure out what to do with herself, other than being a connoisseur, as they say. Whitney purposely waits for King to ask the obvious question. A connoisseur? The ex-secretary can't wait to spill the beans. Oh, you know, bourbon, vodka, gin, rum. She never met a cocktail she didn't like. King smiles politely. Mary says she was with her mother and Margaret the night of the murder. You still work for Mrs. Shelby then, I believe. Were they in all evening? Whitney grabs a pencil and starts chewing on it. I was around, but doing work in the office and then fell asleep early. King studies the former secretary. She looks like a bus passenger who suddenly doesn't want to go on a road trip. Now she's trying to get off at the next stop. Uh, I'm sure they were there most of the evening. Yes, I'm sure of it. Look, detective, I'm going to get in trouble if I don't get back to work. My boss is giving me the side eye. King thanks her for her time. He catches her giving him the side eye as he leaves. King strides briskly across the vast lawn of Westlake Park in downtown L.A. Along the cement path near the man-made lake, he finds U.S. Attorney Tom Green, sitting on a park bench, eating his brown bag lunch. Green is in charge of alcohol and narcotics for the city, and King knows him by reputation only. But what he's heard is that the guy is straight up and doesn't pull punches. Detective King wants to talk to him about a drug angle. Did Taylor anger the wrong people when he tried to get drug pushers kicked off the studio lot? And did one of them want Taylor gone? Charles Iden, the GM for Famous Players, was surprisingly cooperative on sharing what he knew on this angle. He said Taylor had complained that drug use on the set was getting out of control with both cast and crew, and Taylor was willing to help in any way he could. So Iden called in U.S. Attorney Green to investigate. Green personally met with Taylor to get the down low. Green motions King to sit down and offers him half of his pastrami sandwich. King declines. Green talks in between bites. It was a real eye-opener for us. We knew that drug trafficking was rampant in the city, but we didn't know how bad it had gotten with the movie folks. Green goes on to say that Taylor provided a lot of details for the feds. He gave names of dealers and described how peddlers had found creative ways to infiltrate the studio. Some bribed workers behind the gates. Others actually worked on the lot as assistants, messengers, or costumers. Some dealers used the drivers who chauffeured the actors on and off the lot as couriers. Taylor had personally seen the ravages of drugs on his actors. The director also had a very personal reason for his crusade. He confided there was one actress in particular who was being pressured by dealers to keep up her very expensive habit. He was close to this woman and very worried about her. King's ears perk up. Is that Mabel Norman? Green says Taylor didn't give a name, but it's what we suspected. Green tells the detective that Taylor's meddling got Mabel's dealers pretty hot under the collar. It was even a threat. An inside source told one of his agents, somebody's going to get killed on her behalf. King thinks the theory has merit. The dope trade was growing more dangerous by the year. Different gang factions were fighting for territory. Every cop in L.A. saw what the dealers would do to protect their supply lines. If Taylor was making too much noise about the business, it could put him in their crosshairs. So where did your investigation go? King asks the attorney. Green shakes his head in frustration. It went nowhere. Drugs are big money. There are too many wealthy and powerful people in this town who don't want it to go away. Those people made sure we hit dead ends. King can empathize. He's hit plenty of dead ends himself in the Taylor case. Adolf Zucker's train pulls into La Grande Station in Los Angeles on the morning of February 12, 1922. The famous player's Lasky president is in Hollywood for damage control. He was already fending off the censorship movement before the murder of his top director. Now it's even worse. Every salacious headline in every newspaper across the country is giving traction to conservative groups who want to destroy his industry. Just two days ago, over his morning coffee, the headline in one of the papers read, The murder of William Desmond Taylor is exposing the debaucheries, the looseness, the rottenness of Hollywood. Zucker knows too many headlines like these could take down the motion picture industry. If the public stops buying tickets, the investors lose money, and everything Zucker and his fellow moguls have built will crumble to dust. When Zucker arrives at the studio, a group of secretaries usher him to the executive suite. They all tower over Zucker's five-foot frame, but no one notices. His reputation is ten feet tall. 
Zucker's partner, Jesse Lasky, motions everyone out of the room. Lasky wears a checkered suit with a high collar and pushes his glasses high onto his nose. First order of business is to take care of an asset who is turning into a liability. Mary Miles Minter. The young actress is a star, but she's no Mary Pickford. But that isn't stopping her irritating mother from pushing them for a new contract. Lasky tells Zucker Minter's last picture did well, but he doesn't want to re-sign her for Mary Pickford money. Leaking Minter's love letters to Taylor to the papers was a good move. It restored Taylor's reputation as a ladies' man, which the public could handle better than rumors of his homosexuality, and it also gave the studio heads a bargaining chip for Minter's contract negotiations. She can't be America's sweetheart if she's caught up in scandal. Zucker agrees and he knows just how to play it. He'll tell the mother Minter's image is tarnished, and without that image her career is over. But then, out of the goodness of his heart, he'll offer her a new contract for a lot less money. Charlotte Shelby will have no choice but to accept his terms. Lasky nods. What about the investigation? Zucker smiles. The ex-valet is still the LAPD's prime suspect. We have nothing to worry about. Sands isn't directly tied to the movie colony. He's a cook, a valet, a nobody, which is good for famous players. It'll release the heat, he says. Lasky cocks an eyebrow. What about Patricia Palmer, a.k.a. Giddy Gibson? Those papers we pulled out of the boxes at Taylor's. She could really mess things up for famous players. Zucker knits his beetle brows together. I've got it handled. We'll make some arrangements. Give her a few movie roles. She'll play nice. I guarantee it. She's an actress. And actresses want just one thing. To be loved on the big screen. Lasky laughs. That and the money. Let's just hope Sands turns up soon. Zucker deadpans. And that pretty little Patricia, or Gibby, or whatever the hell she calls herself, stays out of trouble. We get support from Simply Safe. Living in a city, I knew for a long time I should get a home security system. But it always just seems so complicated. Which is exactly why Simply Safe was designed to be easy to use while protecting your whole home 24-7. You just order online with the click of a button, open the box, place the sensors, plug it in, and just like that, your home is protected around the clock. No technician or salesperson has to come and disrupt your house. You don't need to pay any outrageous monthly fees or sign a two-year contract. In fact, their 24-7 professional monitoring and emergency dispatch starts at only 50 cents a day. A Simply Safe system has protected my home for at least a year now, and there's a reason I'm never going back. It's easy to set up, easy to use, and I feel protected. It's really that simple. Head to simplysafe.com slash Hollywoodland and you'll get free shipping and a 60-day money-back guarantee. That's simplysafe.com slash Hollywoodland to make sure they know that our show sent you. In the small town of Fox Lake, Illinois, Joe Glinowitz was a hometown hero and a 30-year veteran of the local police department. On September 1st, 2015, just one month from retirement, he was found dead outside of an abandoned cement plant, shot in the chest twice at close range. While the town and Joe's family mourned his passing, hundreds of police officers launched a manhunt to find his killer. After weeks of searching, the lead investigator discovered chilling secrets about Joe, the local police department, and the village of Fox Lake. Secrets that, once uncovered, would put the town in the national spotlight and haunt them for years to come. Wondery's shocking true crime podcast, Over My Dead Body, is back for a third season with a story about corruption, betrayal, and the secrets of a fallen hero. Follow Over My Dead Body Season 3 Fox Lake on Apple Podcasts, or you can listen early and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. William Desmond Taylor hurried up the walk to Mabel Norman's apartment. In his hands was a book, well, actually, six books in one, The Aeneid by Virgil. He chuckled. The old girl deserves some light reading. After a two-night stay at the studio hospital and another relapse in the fall of 1920, he had convinced Mabel to dry out at a sanitarium in New York. She finally agreed. Now she was back and he couldn't wait to see her. Mabel clearly felt the same way. He was barely into the foyer of her cozy duplex when she leapt into his arms. Billy, she shouted. They squeezed each other tight and she buried her face in his neck. He could smell the tabac blonde perfume that she wore. When they broke apart, he held her shoulders and gave her the once over. He had to admit she looked good. When she left for New York, she was gaunt and thin, but now she'd put on some weight. Her cheeks were rosy, her eyes sharp. I am so proud of you, he said. I knew you could do it. Over afternoon tea, the conversation seemed to pick up from where they left off three months earlier, as if no time had passed. Mabel told him she was excited about her prospects and looking forward to her future. You stuck by me through thick and thin, she said. I owe you. He told her, you owe me nothing. You did it yourself. There's nothing you can't do now. There was a loud knock on the back door. Mabel insisted on getting it herself. It's probably a dumb salesman, she said. I'll just go buy everything he has and be right back. Minutes ticked by as Taylor sat on the fluffy white upholstered chair. I hope you're not buying everything, he called out. When she didn't reply, he got up to go check. Mabel was partially shielding the visitor, but when Taylor approached, he saw a man in a delivery outfit holding a small package wrapped in string. Taylor knew what it was. What are you doing? He bellowed at him in a voice that echoed off the walls. He pushed past Mabel and shoved the man in the chest. Get out! You're not welcome here! The man stumbled back, almost falling. He managed to catch himself and glared at Taylor. Taylor repeated himself. 
I said to leave. This lady is no longer in need of your services. The man hissed at him. It's not your call, buster. It's hers. Taylor turned toward Mabel, and for a second, he thought he saw that familiar longing in her eyes. After a long, agonizing moment, she said, no, of course she was no longer interested. Taylor issued a final warning to the man. If you ever come around to harass Miss Norman again, I'll thrash you to hell and back, understand? The man turned to leave, spitting over his shoulder. I'll get you sometime. You can't butt into my trade. Taylor slammed the door shut and latched it. I'm so sorry, Mabel said, tears coming to her eyes. I swear I didn't call him. I'm off all that stuff. He saw she was in distress and embraced her fragile frame, holding her tight to his chest. Mabel's voice was muffled as she said, The guy's a creep. Taylor whispered back, It's okay. Nothing's going to happen. He's gone. But the man left Taylor with an unsettled feeling. He wasn't so sure. It's the summer of 1922, a long six months since William Desmond Taylor was found dead in his apartment. Police across the country are still on the lookout for Edward Sands, Taylor's ex-valet, and the prime suspect in his murder. But so far the search has been filled with false leads and rumored sightings. Everyone involved in the case, from the sheriff's office to the LAPD, is frustrated by the lack of forward movement. No matter how many clues they followed up on, nothing seems to pan out. Even the once hungry press has moved the story to the back pages. Detective Ed King is frustrated too. He personally traveled up California and down to Mexico in pursuit of Sands. Taylor's ex-valet is either a criminal mastermind, a lucky son of a gun, or just plain dead. Not that King thinks Sands is the guilty party. He's never wavered in his belief that Mary Miles Minter and her mother Charlotte have something to do with the director's murder. And District Attorney Thomas Woolwine has never wavered from his belief that King is dead wrong. But since announcing his candidacy for governor, Woolwine is spending less time in the office and more time on the campaign trail. His absence is buying King the space he needs to pursue leads without his boss looking over his shoulder. Meanwhile, life goes on in Hollywood. Someone else has moved into Taylor's apartment at 404B Alvarado Court. The director's belongings are sold off at an auction in downtown L.A. A junk dealer buys two pairs of his pearl gray shoe spats, while a truck driver snaps up most of the dead director's hats. Even his prized McFarlane goes for a song, bought by an up-and-coming studio producer named Louis B. Mayer. Mayer will one day run MGM, one of the most powerful studios in town. But for now, he loads his family into the car and drives it away. Taylor's possessions are now scattered in disparate places, much like the clues to his mysterious death. Edward Sands leaned against William Desmond Taylor's garage, waiting. The pudgy, red-faced valet was smiling to himself, taking long, luxurious drags from the imported cigarette he had pilfered from his employer's special stash. As he smoked, the valet toyed with his prized personal possession, a Colt 45 he had since he first enlisted in the Navy as a teenager. It was the spring of 1921. Sands had been working for Taylor for almost a year, and he figured a cigarette or two was his for the taking. It had been so easy to snag this job. He'd gone from cooking for the studio commissary to cooking for a major director in just months, and he's also his valet. It was a far cry from where he came. Before he landed here, he'd been court-martialed for embezzlement, served one year of hard labor, and deserted the military six times. He came to Hollywood to reinvent himself. He even changed his name from Edward Snyder Strathmore to Edward Sands. Everyone deserves a do-over, he figured. No one, including his new boss, knew about his criminal past, and nobody asked, which is exactly why L.A. appealed to Sands. Here, you could take on a new persona and identity without anyone caring. He quickly ingratiated himself with Taylor, who praised his cooking, said it eased his painful stomach ulcer. He complimented Sands on the way he kept his home and personal affairs in order. It was true that Sands worked hard for Taylor, at least in the beginning. Now, he had other things in mind. Sands watched as Taylor's driver, Earl Tiffany, pulled around the corner in the director's fancy McFarlane automobile. He had just dropped him at work, so the whole day was wide open. He took a last long drag of the cigarette. Of course, the old man had to have gold-tipped smokes. The best of everything all the time. And all that money for what? Directing make-believe stories? But Sands knew stuff about his boss. Knew he was no different than him. Made him wonder how Taylor got so lucky while Sands was still working for peanuts. As Tiffany expertly parked the $11,000 car in the garage, Sands marched forward to meet him. Sands smiled, casually pulled the gun from his pocket and pointed it directly at Tiffany. The look of shock and fear on the driver's face was worth its weight in gold. What gives, Sands? Put that thing away. Sands stood staring into space for a long moment. Then he suddenly burst into laughter and dropped his gun hand to his side. You should have seen your face, he told Tiffany. I nearly pissed myself. Tiffany said he didn't like having a gun pointed at him, even as a joke. What a lump, Sands thought. But he let it go. He liked Tiffany. In the last several months, the young chauffeur had become a sidekick in his little investigative forays around Taylor's apartment. It had become a fun game, and it broke up the boredom whenever Taylor was gone. Sands had already found so much interesting information, and today he was planning on showing Tiffany his latest discovery. He apologized about the gun. Yeah, sure, said Tiffany, who was still a bit shaky. Why do you have that thing anyway? 
Sand shrugged. You can never be too careful, he said, walking back to Taylor's bungalow. And I might want to blow my brains out one day, before I turn 35. Then he changed the subject. Come on, I have something to show you. You're never going to believe this. William Desmond Taylor isn't even his real name. Sands led Tiffany to Taylor's writing desk. He proudly showed Tiffany the letters he found between Taylor and his daughter. No one knew Taylor had a kid. Or that the director had changed his name from William Dean Tanner to William Desmond Taylor. He could see Tiffany didn't appreciate the value of the information before them. Some people didn't understand opportunity when it hit them square in the kisser. Unlike Sands, who understood many things, he understood that Taylor was not the great man he pretended to be. And here, Sands had gone out of his way to show Taylor his devotion. He'd written a note to him swearing he would be his servant for life. But Taylor didn't seem to care. He laughed. But Sands didn't think it was funny. And he didn't like how the director's fancy friends snickered at him. The stuck-up actresses who lived across the courtyard wouldn't even look his way. All because he wolf-whistled and complimented them on how nice their legs looked. They called him fresh. They could say whatever they wanted to, but Sands was going to have the last laugh. And Taylor, he'd get what he deserved. His opportunity came a few months later in the summer of 1921. Taylor had shipped off to London to recuperate after stomach surgery. While he was gone, the director allowed a friend to stay at his place and left Sands a blank check to cover any expenses for his guest. Sands wrote the check out to himself instead and practicing the signature forged several more. Then came the coup de grace. Sands took a joyride in Taylor's beloved McFarlane and crashed it, just like he'd done in the Navy when he'd stolen a car. And just like he did after that event, he disappeared. He'd even taken a trunk full of Taylor's possessions, including seven of his best suits. Yes, indeed, Sands had the last laugh. But there was more to come. Time for another type of true crime. After you finish your blast from the past with murder in Hollywoodland, check out Wondery's latest true crime obsession, Guru, the Dark Side of Enlightenment. After appearing on Oprah, thousands flocked to seek the guidance of renowned self-help guru James Arthur Ray. He was a charismatic speaker whose unorthodox methods and philosophies promised his followers a clear path to wealth and happiness. But what many didn't know about were his more extreme methods, methods that pushed his pupils to their limits, giving some the transformative experience they dreamed of, and killing others. Stay tuned until the end of this episode to hear a preview of Guru, the Dark Side of Enlightenment from Wondery. Mary Miles Minter gazes with trepidation at the large brown gelding trotting around the corral. It's July 1922, on the set of her new film shooting in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Her contract negotiations didn't go quite the way her mother had planned, but she's still working, and it feels good to be out of Los Angeles for a few weeks. It's like another world here. She can even see the snow-capped Grand Tetons in the distance. The name of the picture is The Cowboy and the Lady. It's kind of silly, but Mary has the lead role as the lady, which calls for riding that big horse. A brown-eyed brunette saunters over, pulling on her hat. You've never been on one, have you? Mary is a little insulted. Of course I have. He's just particularly big. Mary knows the smart Alec actress. She'd met Gibby Gibson way back when at a motion picture exhibitor's ball. They had both come to Hollywood to make it in the movies. Gibby seemed to be on her way to success, but then ran into some hard times. Mary vaguely recalls an incident in Little Tokyo. An arrest, maybe? It's fuzzy, but Gibby seemed to fall off the map. Mary wonders how Gibby landed a decent-sized role in this picture. Probably helps that she got a new name, Patricia Palmer, to wipe the slate clean. Mary doesn't wonder too much about it. Everyone is always reinventing themselves in Hollywood in some way or another. Hell, Mary used to be Juliet Riley, but Patricia will always be Gibby to her. Gibby smiles at Mary. Hey, is it really true you and Billy Taylor were in love? Mary shoots her a look of surprise. Why do you refer to him as Billy? Gibby gets a melancholy look on her face. A long time ago, we knew each other well. We starred in four movies together. He told me to call him Billy. It's no trouble for Mary to answer. She loves talking about Mr. Taylor. Yes, it's true. We were very much in love. But destiny tore us apart. I shall think of him every day until I die. We are forever bound to one another. A shadow crosses over Gibby's face. But just as quickly it's gone. Hey, I have a flask in my cabin. Let's go get into some trouble. Mary hesitates. Her mother definitely wouldn't approve. But why does she need to listen to her anymore? Mrs. Shelby is not her jail warden. Mary will be 20 soon. An adult. She's going to move out and be the mistress of her own destiny. Sure, let's go, she says. Who's going to stop us? Detective Ed King and Sergeant Jesse Wynn climb the back stairs at the Pantages Theater at 7th and Hill Streets. It's October, 1922. When they reach the top, they follow the hall to a door at the end. A sign on it says, Nick Harris, Private Detective. Both King and Wynn have worked with Harris before. He was a police detective in a previous life, and an investigative reporter. He had even helped King with the Gladys Weatherall kidnapping case a year ago, and the department awarded him a gold badge for his efforts. Now they're hoping Harris can help them find out more about Charlotte Shelby. Since Taylor's murder, Shelby has been hiding behind an army of lawyers, not to mention Woolwine's warm blanket of protection. She's also kept a low profile in the press. No doubt about it. The woman is shrewd. If King stands a chance of getting Charlotte, he needs to get creative. That time has come. 
Harris greets the two detectives with a hearty handshake and slap on the back. On his walls are framed articles featuring cases he solved or helped solve. The gold LAPD badge the chief awarded him last year is on his desk. King tells the private eye what he needs. I'd like you to call the editor of the Los Angeles Times and invent a little story about a spiritualist phoning your office. The spiritualist is going to say that the desperate mother of a very beautiful daughter killed William Desmond Taylor, and it just so happened that this psychic telephoned when both Wynn and I were paying you a visit. Harris leans in. Damn brilliant. I love it. King isn't surprised by the private eye's enthusiasm. He and Wynn already know that Harris uses many spiritualist sources and he's superstitious himself, always puts his left shoe on first, and never handles a pen after it's been used by someone else. The detectives don't blink an eye. Hey, it's Hollywood. King wants Harris to sweeten the story. The spiritualist will be ready to publicly identify the woman in two weeks, unless she comes forward on her own. King figures once the story is printed, Shelby will be so worried she'll come out of the shadows to give the police her side of what happened. Then King will pounce, sit her down for the first time, and ask her everything he's been wanting to ask her since the beginning of the investigation, as long as Mrs. Shelby takes the bait. Charlotte Shelby's fist pounded on the front door of William Desmond Taylor's apartment. When he didn't answer, she relentlessly pressed the buzzer. The sound bounced throughout the courtyard. Lights went on, but Taylor's place remained dark. It was midnight. Shelby was frantic. Mary had snuck out of the house earlier that night, and Charlotte couldn't find her. She suspected the girl had gone to see dear Mr. Taylor against her wishes. Finally, an upstairs light went on. A window was raised, and Taylor called down to her. Who's there? Charlotte's voice could barely contain the panic and anger raging in her breast. This is Mrs. Shelby. I'll be right down, ma'am. He was so polite, she thought, so calm. It made her even angrier. When he opened the front door, he was wearing his bathrobe. She swept by him into the house. Where is she? Taylor seemed confused. She? Shelby looked at Taylor in disbelief. My daughter, Mary, who do you think? Is she upstairs? Is she in your bed right now? Taylor rubbed his eyes and told her he was alone. She was free to look around. Charlotte peered in the dimly lit living room. The apartment was silent. She realized he was telling the truth. She let out a breath, her thoughts still racing. Taylor offered her a drink. God knows she needed one. But she didn't want Taylor to perceive any weakness, so she declined. I'm sorry I came here. Good night. Shelby left without saying another word. She quickly walked to the curb, and then down the pitch-dark block where she had requested her chauffeur park her car. Once inside, she sat in the back across from her secretary, Charlotte Whitney. Shelby was trembling as she pulled something out of her coat pocket. Whitney looked at her with wide, frightened eyes. Charlotte held up the blue steel thirty-eight revolver she was gripping tightly in her hands. I didn't have to use it, she said. Mary wasn't there. The headline in the Los Angeles Times on the morning of October 5th, 1922 reads, Spirit has real dope on killing. It's Ed King's phony story about the psychic, and it's already the talk of the town. He's anxious to see if his plan will shed light on the truth and help him catch Taylor's murderer. The article describes the killer as a woman, prominently known in Los Angeles, with a beautiful daughter. It claims the psychic called a private detective to share his vision, while some LAPD detectives just happened to be in his office. Sure enough, the next morning, a lawyer shows up at the central police station and searches out King. The lawyer demands to know the name of the spiritualist on behalf of his client but he refuses to reveal his client's identity. King is certain it's Charlotte Shelby. He's sure he has finally succeeded in shaking her up, but he'll need to do more to make something stick. He'll need real proof. King understands why Charlotte Shelby is a hard sell. After all, no one had seen a woman leaving the premises after the murder, but she's got a compelling motive. The woman has a wicked temper whenever she feels threatened, which seems to be often, especially if it has to do with her daughter. Shelby's fortune is made off of Mary. Losing her to a man could very well cut off her cash flow. Yes, Charlotte Shelby has a lot to lose. King has to find solid evidence to present. If he's learned anything in his two decades on the force, it's that sometimes the answer is to go back to the beginning. With all the leads and loose ends surrounding this case, he wouldn't be surprised if something had been overlooked. King and his partner, Wynn, head to the dank property room where the hard evidence is kept. But when the detectives arrive, they learn the DA's office has ordered Taylor's belongings be destroyed as non-essential evidence. King isn't sure if it's an administrative error or if Woolwine has other motives, but he's not wasting any time. So what did you do with the clothes? He asks the board-looking attendant. The guy isn't in any hurry to answer. He licks his thumb each time he slowly flips a page in the record book. Wynn steps in. Any day now. The attendant picks up the pace. Looks like they got sent to Overholter's mortuary. Wynn looks at King. Isn't that where the body was autopsied? King nods. When were they sent there? The attendant scratches his head. Yesterday, I think. Better hurry. Not sure how long they keep stuff before it gets incinerated. The two cops race over to the mortuary. A secretary tells him the clothes are in back, in a pile, ready to be burned. King tries to keep his cool. I'm with the LAPD. We'll need those back. Evidence. When she returns, she's carrying a pile of garments. You got here just in time, she tells them. Back at the precinct, Wynn and King comb through the dead man's clothes, using a magnifying glass and bright light. King stops cold. He doesn't believe what he sees. Under the jacket collar are three solitary blonde hairs. He picks them up with tweezers and bags them. The long blonde hairs obviously don't belong to Taylor. 
but King knows one person known for her fair curls, a young starlet who claims she didn't see Taylor in the five weeks prior to his murder. Wynne asks King, Do you think the hair is Minter's? King smiles. I think we need to pay a visit to the set and find out. He knows Mary Miles Minter is making a movie at Famous Players Lasky. Wynne cocks his head. You really think she's going to talk? King nods. She doesn't need to yet. I have a plan. When King arrives on the set, he parks his bike behind a grove of fake palm trees and finds a delivery boy about to walk in. You know where the dressing room is for Mary Miles Minter? Sure do, the boy says. Five bucks if you sneak in and bring me some hair from her hairbrush. The boy's eyes light up. You kidding me, mister? You're on. Thirty minutes later, King is back at the station with the ingenue's hair under the microscope of a forensic expert. He compares them with the hairs found on Taylor's jacket. The expert pulls off his glasses and looks at King. They're a match. It's the break King's been after for months. Hard evidence that places Mary at the scene of the crime on the night of the murder. The district attorney will have to listen to him now. On the next episode of Murder in Hollywoodland, more tantalizing clues point to Charlotte Shelby's involvement in William Taylor's death, and a surprise witness emerges with shocking allegations that forces the hand of a new district attorney. This was episode four of six of Murder in Hollywoodland from Hollywood and Crime. If you like what you've heard, be sure to tell your friends and fans of true crime. We're counting on you to help us spread the word. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app to listen ad-free. In the episode notes, you'll find some links and offers from our sponsors. Please support them. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey at wondery.com slash survey. Murder in Hollywoodland was written by Elizabeth Cosen and produced and edited by Laura Donna Palavoda. Additional editing assistance by Leah Sutherland. Sound design by Kyle Randall. Audio assistance by Sergio Enriquez. Additional audio editing by Marcelino Villalpando. Our consultant is William J. Mann. His book, Tinseltown, Murder, Morphine, and Madness at the Dawn of Hollywood, has a lot more amazing stories about Hollywood and the way the studios operated in the silent era. Executive producers are Marshall Louis, Stephanie Jens, and Hernan Lopez, or Wondery. You're about to hear a preview of Guru, The Dark Side of Enlightenment from Wondery. While you're listening, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or listen ad-free in the Wondery app. It was March 2009, and in a big chain hotel in New Jersey, a crowd milled around, waiting. Once the doors opened, everyone headed for the same place. It was a large auditorium with a big stage in front. The event was called the Harmonic Wealth Weekend, a rigorous two-day seminar that promised to get participants on the fast track to personal and professional success. It wasn't the kind of thing Ginny Brown was normally into, but her daughter, Kirby, had insisted that they go together. As they walked in, she had to admit, the atmosphere was exciting. And we had to walk through a gauntlet, I will say, of cheerleaders who were jumping up and down, revving up the energy in the room. And I remember saying to one woman, I said, man, you, you girls really had your coffee this morning. And she said to me, oh, we don't drink coffee. Like, that's poison. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I do, and I love it. <laughs> As everyone took their seats, the lights dimmed. James Arthur Ray stepped onto the stage and began a version of a speech he often gave. Let's talk about what's changing right now in your world. You see, I firmly believe that you live in the most exciting time in our world history. It's a time where science and spirituality are realizing that they're sister studies. James was tanned with a bright white smile, wearing a bright white shirt. Pretty trim, athletic build, fairly good looking. Just can't get going in the morning without my coffee. <clears throat> Give me a freaking break! Total command of the audience. People laughed. They nodded their heads like, yeah. You know, that high energy kind of environment is just kind of fun. You, you want to be part of it. You want to belong. You don't want to stand out and be kind of against what's going on. Because James Ray was a star. Law of attraction says like attracts like. And as you lock your attention upon that, then another particle which is in harmony with it is attracted. And another is attracted. And another is attracted. And bang, you've got a Mercedes. On stage, he talked about reflecting on yourself and your position in life. Then, he began to pull audience members onto the stage and ask them questions. And I'd like to ask for two volunteers to help me out here. I need a couple of volunteers, okay? Come on, both of you, come on up. Give them a hand. Give them a hand as they come up. First, Ginny was impressed. I was fascinated by his ability to really read someone. You know, he read people really well. But as she watched, something began to nag at her. There were a couple of times where he brought people up on the stage and had them reveal very deep, personal, troubling things in their life. Ginny is a clinical social worker. And I sat there thinking, hmm, you know, as a trained therapist, those are the kinds of questions that I would ask if someone was sitting in my office. Not in front of hundreds of people. I was both fascinated and uncomfortable. She turned to her daughter, Kirby, who was mesmerized. 
just said, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's really not such a great thing to do. But Kirby was focused on James. Kirby was in her late 30s and had bounced around careers and relationships. She wanted more success and stability in her life. Ginny knew that Kirby had been doing her own soul searching and that James's teachings had already helped. And she was going to stay there to get the most out of the experience, whether she believed everything or not. But neither of us ever thought he was dangerous. Later that year, after attending another James Ray event with her father, Kirby Brown would get in her car and drive to Sedona, Arizona for a five-day intensive retreat with James called Spiritual Warrior. For James's followers, it was the pinnacle event of their journey, and Kirby spent her life savings nearly $10,000 to be there. The retreat started on October 4th, 2009. Five days later, Ginny was at home in upstate New York. Around 8 a.m., the doorbell rang. At 8.15, the trooper comes to the door and asked me if I know Kirby Brown. You know, my first thought was, oh my God, is she in some kind of trouble? But it was more than trouble. Ginny would never see her daughter again. Subscribe to Wondery's new miniseries, Guru, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or binge all six episodes and listen ad-free on the Wondery app.